There is so much in this manifesto. It is a theme, leadership of service, protecting our progress and transforming Ghana for all. The manifesto is organized in three segments. You have one section, the beginning, which is accounting for our leadership. We were given a mandate, and how have we performed as far as that mandate is concerned? That is the first part of the manifesto. Then the second part deals with the consolidation of our progress. Having made so much progress, we want to consolidate that pro progress, and then we are able to move forward. And the third part is the acceleration of growth, the plan for acceleration of growth. So these are the three parts of the manifesto um, that the various presenters um, were putting together uh, so beautifully. Of course, we are all reminded from the very beginning the mess that this government inherited from the mismanagement of the economy under the previous government, with doom so, collapsing NHIS, and, and, and so on. It was a mess, uh, including the coll a collapsing banking sector and financial sector. So we promised to fix this, and we proceeded to fix the broken economy, invest in critical and national infrastructure, and make the government machinery work. I would go to briefly talk about the accounting section for, 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 of the manifesto. In this section, we list all the achievements that we have actually chalked in our three and a half years in every sector, 17 sectors in all, and we have listed all the achievements. There are 20, 289 separate promise categories, and we have listed over 300 achievements that we have in three and a half years. Over 300 achievements. And so when you read the manifesto, you will see that we have fulfilled at least 80% of our promises. That is massive for any government in its first term, 80% of our pro promises. And when you look at all these achievements, you realize that sector by sector, we have really performed better, much, much better than the previous NDC government. So that is the issue of accounting for our progress. Then we go into consolidating our gains or consolidating our achievements. And here, we want to make sure that post-COVID, post-COVID, we are able to consolidate all the achievements that we chalked and then be able to move the country forward. So this is consolidating our achievements in agriculture, in industrialization, the infrastructure, and so on. So we have so much to consolidate, and all these achievements that we talked about, free SHS and so on, we are not going to let them go. We are going to continue and deepen them and implement them and consolidate them for the benefit of all Ghanaians. The final section of the manifesto deals with our accelerated growth agenda. Of course, as the economy is very key. And if you want to accelerate growth, you have to tackle some of the key bottlenecks going forward. And our number one priority is to stimulate growth, de development, and investment in the real sectors of the economy, the real sectors that make the difference, particularly in agriculture, industrialization, digitization, ensuring macroeconomic stability, and engendering the econ economic transformation of our country. So if you look 
at the industrialization segment of what we are trying to do uh, going forward. We want to support uh, the Made in Ghana products, including supporting the use of local raw materials. The COVID experience has brought the Ghana Beyond Aid into immediate action, where we are going to be more self-reliant as, as a country and as an economy. So we are going to focus on more Made in Ghana. We will renew our emphasis on component assembly, not just in automobiles, but also home appliances and light manufacturing in general. We will deepen and expand the 1D1F, and we will focus on implementing the integrated bauxite and aluminum industry, as well as the iron and steel industry. The preparatory work for these two industries is now complete. The legal uh, framework is set. And in our next term, inshallah, you will see Ghana realize the vision, the long-held vision of building an integrated bauxite and in aluminum industry, as well as an integrated iron ore and steel industry, which will be based in the northern part of Ghana. As we add value to our raw materials and our minerals, we will also be passing into law a mineral re revenue management law, similar to the petroleum revenue management law, which will be a first in this country. In the area of agriculture, uh, we will accelerate the activities under the planting for export and rural development, will accelerate the implementation of the greenhouse village concept, and our efforts in expanding our agricultural mechanization centers, as well as promote import substitution with a focus on rice, sugar, and poultry. Rice, sugar, and poultry are areas where we spend a lot of foreign exchange. But our vision is to make Ghana self-sufficient in the production of these three key commodities that we have chosen to focus on in the area of import substitution. When you come to education, it's very, very important that we consolidate the free SHS and the free TVET programs and deepen them. But beyond free SHS, we are concerned also about tertiary education. It is very important that we note that the link between tertiary education and economic development is very, very strong. Countries which have high tertiary enrollment rates have much higher levels of economic development. If you look at South Korea, the gross tertiary enrollment ratio in South Korea is 94%. If you look at Ghana, our gross tertiary enrollment ratio is less than 17%. So if we are to catch up and build the human capital that will help us transform the economy, then we have to get more enrollment into the tertiary sectors. Now, one of the problems for, for students in getting enrollment, in getting access to tertiary education is affordability, whether it's enrollment in the public or the private universities. The ability to get uh, the money just like it used to be under uh, free, under the secondary education, many, many students were not able to access it. There is also a bottleneck that we are trying to address because when the senior high school students graduate, many of them will look to go for tertiary education. And we have to facilitate their ability to access tertiary education. So we have a major promise a policy initiative which will say that all tertiary students except 
teacher and nursing trainees who will be on allowances. But all tertiary students will now be able to get the option to obtain a student loan without the requirement of a guarantor. The problem for many tertiary students is we, the current scheme asks for guarantors. And you know, a lot of people are not willing to put their pensions online. So they, many students are not able to access. So you don't need a guarantor. All you need is your national ID card. That's all. And then you will be able to access your loan and once you complete the tertiary education, uh, repayment will be deferred. After your national service, you will get one year grace after the national service before you start repaying. So it's a major um, tertiary in education initiative to enable us improve access to tertiary education uh, as, as well. We are also going to implement the $219 million Ghana Accountability for Learning Outcomes Project. This is known as the Gallup Project. And it is a project for which the funding has already been secured. And what is this project about? We have identified 10,000 low-performing schools in Ghana. Their performance is quite low. And we have got this program where we are going to improve, target these 10,000 schools and improve their performance by giving them additional funding in addition to their capitation grants uh, and also support the teachers additionally so that they can raise the levels of performance of these 10,000 schools so that they will not be left behind. This is the Gallup program that we are going to be implementing. In addition, we want to make sure that we focus on education in the Zongo communities. So we are building in each of the 16 regions. We are building model senior high schools in Zongo communities in the 16 region. So we have 16 model senior high schools in the 16 regions of Ghana in the Zongo communities. Of course, one of the areas that has not received enough attention is in the area of special needs education. And we are going to focus on special needs. A lot of our children in, who are suffering from autism or cerebral palsy and, and other special needs need support. And government needs to support uh, many, many organizations who are in the private sector trying to also help. And we're going to increase the resources and infrastructure for special needs education across the country. We will also expand infrastructure to increase access to professional legal education. This is one area that the limited infrastructure in the law school really um, limits intake. And so there's a lot of frustration with many prospective lawyers not able to get in. So we are going to ex help expand the infrastructure needs so that we can get more people who are able to study to study. We will also complete the provision of free Wi-Fi at all senior secondary schools and public tertiary institutions. The process has started. A contract has already been awarded. Uh, and ECG is also levering its fiber network across the country. And even before the end of this year, we will be starting from the ECG perspective on the tertiary institutions. But inshallah, by next year, we expect most of the work, if not all, our senior high schools and tertiary to have free Wi-Fi for their studies. Then we look at health, which um, my good friend Okoboy talked about. Uh, we have a major program in the health sector. 
We have Agenda 111, which used to be Agenda 88. We're going to build district hospitals wherever they have are none, 102 in all, two additional psychiatric hospitals, and seven regional hospitals. Six in each of the new regions. We are building the regional hospitals in the six new regions and one in western region in addition to the rehabilitation of Efiankwanta Hospital. So that is a major infrastructure area that we are going, and it's the biggest healthcare infrastructure that we are going to be putting in place for many, many years. We will focus, ladies and gentlemen, on health promotion and prevention as part of primary health care through the National Health Insurance Scheme to achieve universal health care. It is important for us to note that 95% of the disease burden is already covered under NHIS primary, secondary, or tertiary diseases. It's already covered. And children, the elderly, and vulnerable groups don't have to pay the NHIS premiums anyway. So if you say you are going to offer free primary health care, it's almost meaningless. Because if you have free primary health care and you don't have an NHIS card and you go for a checkup and they say go for secondary treatment, what are you going to do? So our focus is going to be on the promotion and prevention of you know, primary uh, health and promotion and prevention as part of primary health care. We are also going to work with the Ghana Medical and Dental Council to streamline the admission processes for foreign trained doctors. The, the discussions with a lot of foreign trained doctors speaks to a lot of frustration that they have in joining the normal medical uh, core, especially some of our brothers and sisters who have trained in Cuba when they come in. We are going to discuss with the Ghana Med Medical Council to streamline those processes to enhance access. We will also help by expanding access to medical schools in Ghana by building additional facilities and augment its human resource base. Ladies and gentlemen, we will eliminate import duties on sanitary pads to improve health conditions, particularly for girls. It's very important, but what we want to really do is to make sure we produce the sanitary pads in Ghana. Until that happens in their numbers, we are going to eliminate the import duties to, to bring down the cost. And the focus in this era of digitization we are going to also focus on telemedicine. Now that will reduce the cost as doctors can diagnose and prescribe um, at a distance and don't have to be particularly at a, a, a location. Then I move on to housing. The housing sector is one of the sectors that we are, God willing, going to focus a lot on in the next term. There are three components of our housing policy. It is clear that there are a lot of youth who, when they finish school, just trying to rent accommodation is a big problem. And why is it? The large demands for rent allowance, sometimes up to two years demand. But someone who is finished school and just starting job, a job doesn't have those savings to pay all these huge demands for rent allowance. The landlords, on the other hand, have gotten used to asking, even though the law says six months, they've gotten used to asking for two years and insist on it because they, they are saying that they don't know if the tenant will run away or not, so they want to collect it up front. So there is a market failure. There is a market failure between what the tenants want and what the landlords want. And this is why government has decided to come in and bridge this market failure by setting up a national rental assistance scheme. And under this scheme, you know, if you have a job 
and we can deduct regularly from your income. Under this scheme, the National Rent Assistance Scheme will give you a loan to pay your rent allowance. But it is, we are paying this not to you, but to the landlord. And then we will deduct monthly uh, as you would normally pay. So we are bridging this. Uh, you need to have a formal employment, uh, which will allow us um, or guarantee a gar someone who will guarantee uh, so that you can pay. But it is very, very important that we address this. And uh, we are going to be putting in place a 100 million Ghana cities for the rental, National Rental Assistance Scheme and work with the private sector to crowd in more so that we can get this done and relieve a lot of people who are renting of the burden. We are also going to digitize the National Rent Control Board and a new law which has been, been coming to cabinet will also pass a new Rent Control Act to become modern with our times. So we are doing the rental housing. Then we are going to focus next on low-income housing uh, we, through... Uh, the land banks that we have already gotten together, we are going to build housing estates because the focus, a lot of people in the, in the low income category cannot really buy many of the affordable homes that are being built. But if you have low income housing, they can rent or they can rent to own. Uh, and that will provide a lot of low-income people access to housing with a lot of infrastructure around it. And the low-income housing, we're going to be working with the Building Roads and Research Institute, BRRI. We've looked at some of their designs, and they are very cost-effective once we use local materials and we can put up many estates to deal with this over time. Of course, the affordable housing, so to speak, for the middle incomes through the mortgage market will continue. But a third aspect of the land, of the land housing area is a reform or the complete digitization of the land administration in this country. We have started the process of putting together land digitization, and we will complete it by the grace of God in our next step. We want to make sure that when anybody is trying to buy a land, you can go to the computer and know who owns this land. Very, very simply so that the litigation around land goes. And this is going to be a major focus uh, for, for, for us in, in, in our next term, God willing. Um, of course, we are going to do this physical infrastructure. All of you have seen our delivery tracker web website uh, that we have put in place to show the massive amount of infrastructure that has been done. Uh, of course, we, are, we have challenged the NDC to put together a similar website so that we can see what they have done feely feely rather than green book style. They should go district by district, put all their infrastructure together, and we will, we will see. So we are going to continue building on infrastructure. Year of roads, water for all, toilets for all, and all of that. We will continue doing that. We will continue the construction. We'll have construction in Sunyani and Keta of water supply projects, of course, in addition to those going on in Tamale, Yendi, Damango, and so on. We'll accelerate our investments in roads, railways, and ports. And for the people of Cape Coast, I have good news for you. We are building a new harbor in Cape Coast and a new airport in Cape Coast. It is very critical that we do that. An airport makes a lot of sense in Cape Coast. It's a real tourist hub, and between Greater Accra, Kumasi, and Cape Coast, you have a triangle that really is a lot of hub of economic activity. You can build railway lines between them, and it's a major growth pool if we put an airport here uh, to, to drive infrastructure growth.
course, we are going to continue to construct the Eastern Line. We are going to construct the Eastern Line and the Ghana Burkina Line, which is also very, very much. Uh, the Buankrap Inland Port, the Bupe Port, uh, and the Atuabu Port are the key uh, ports that we are also going to be looking at uh, going forward. Ladies and gentlemen, in the area of social protection, we, 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 we are going to make sure that all those in various databases receiving you know, social protection support, we bring the databases together and everybody will be uniquely identified by their national ID card. And it will allow us better to be able to target and deliver social services rather than having a situation where you have no idea the full picture, who is accessing what and who is not. We'll ensure the enactment of an aging bill for the elderly and also an affirmative action bill, which has been long overdue. We will mainstream the disability issues by implementing broadly the provisions in the Persons with Disability Act 2206 Act 715. And in particular, we want to address access to facilities, transportation, and equal employment. The creative arts has already been mentioned. We see the creative arts as a major growth pool. There's so much talent in the creative arts, but the problem they have is access to studios uh, because there's not, no capital to do that. And so this is why we are going to set up large recording studios in Accra, Kumasi, Tema, and Takradi as part of our entrepreneurial hub strategy in partnership with the private sector. So, and this would be for recording artists to rent space, do their recordings in these studios. Um, the Creative Arts Fund is going to come up as part of the Creative Arts Bill that has been passed by cabinet and is going to parliament. And of course, the completion of the theaters in Kumasi and the construction of new ones in Takoradi and Tamale. In the area of governance, we are going to continue to improve the financing of anti-corruption agencies. We've seen the biggest increase in financing for anti-corruption agencies under the Nana Kufuado government. We will continue to provide resources for, for the implementation of the Right to Information Act and for the Right to Information Commission to be operationalized. And we will assist the National Media Commission to implement fully the coordinated mechanism for safety of journalists and ensure the completion of property valuation and digitization of valuation rules across the country. In the area of governance, we've talked to the House of Chiefs, the National House of Chiefs, and we have a number of policies that we want to implement. We want to see the the passage of the Chieftaincy Amendment Bill, the ally on the membership of the National House of Chiefs, and a codification and digitization of the customary laws and the lines of succession. Once this is done, the disputes will abate because you don't, currently there's no codification, and so there's so much dispute when it comes to succession. But we believe that we, we can help the House of Chiefs codify and digitize all these so that it's there for everybody to see. Now, when we go to the acceleration of, of growth using the private sector as the vehicle, we're thinking of two major areas. One is digitization, uh, and the other really is a focus on the private sector. The building a digital infrastructure uh, and a digital uh, service economy is something that we are going to focus on. You've already seen the, a lot of infrastructure that has been put in place for digitization. The Minister for Communications in the video talked about all the work that she's been leading to put in place the digital infrastructure for the country. We've now got the national ID system, we have digital ad, uh, address system, we have mobile money interoperability, and so on. This is solid digital infrastructure. 
we are going to reduce the high cost of data um, and re reduce taxes on digital devices. We are moving into a digital era, so data costs and the cost of digital devices, we'll look at it, reduce spectrum and license costs, and further, the cost of international calls to support both regional and international trade by removing the mandatory 19 cents per minute tariff for international incoming calls. As we, we see it, it is more of a nuisance tax, and we will abolish this 19 cents per minute tariff for international incoming calls and replace it with a competitive regime. Uh, it, in fact, the existence of this 19 cent tariff is one of the causes of the Simbox fraud that we have been seeing uh, over the, the years. So we will abolish it. We will leverage the digital transformation as growth by increasing broadband coverage, as Joe Anochi talked about. And we will integrate our existing infrastructure. It's going to be very, very important. We've got all these, this infrastructure that we've put in place. They are in silos. For example, we will link the National Identification Authority with the Births and Deaths Registry. With that linkage between NIA and Births and Deaths Registry, which we will do next year, it means that immediately you are born, your birth will be recorded by the NIA, and right then you will be given a national ID number right at birth, which will stay with you through to death. We will link the NIA also to the Ghana Revenue Authority to broaden our tax base. Currently, we have less than 3 million people who have signed up for tax identification number. And if you don't have a tax identification number, access to some of the government services becomes difficult. Currently, we have 3 million people. And we've said, how can we make sure everybody pretty much has a tax identification number? The answer is simple. We are going to convert every NIA number into a tax identification number. So if you have your NIA card, your NIA number will be your TIN number, and the matter is finished. And by the beginning of next year, we should have at least 16 million TIN numbers, and that changes the economy. It broadens the, the tax base and brings everybody into the formal economy. And so this is what the sort of thing that we are going to be doing, linking all these databases with the ANCOR being the national ID card. Of course, we will put together a national data center. We want to develop Ghana as a regional hub uh, and leverage on the uh, um, Ghana's position as the secretariat of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. We'll build a financial services hub, a mining hub, aviation and logistics, petroleum, automobile, tourism, and a digital services hub. We are in the process of focusing on all of these areas, and we are going to make Ghana the real trade hub in the sub-region and become a regional hub. That is the way we are going, and there's no reason why we are not going to be able to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have another major issue as far as the private sector is concerned, and that is access and the cost of finance. And government wants to support the private sector and the public by addressing this major bottleneck, addressing the access and the cost of finance. How are we going to do this? We have four um, initiatives that we are putting in place. First is the national equipment leasing policy. We have a problem, generally, that every time we want to buy capital equipment, whether it's cars or photocopiers or whatever, we pay cash fully for them. But once we buy these vehicles, our maintenance culture is also very poor. 
And we are not able to maintain most of these vehicles or this equipment, whether it's in the hospitals or in the ministries. We have decided that to save a lot of money and to make sure that this equipment can be maintained, rather than outright purchases of these capital equipment, we will rather lease them and pay over time Therefore, we can buy a lot more equipment. The maintenance is not going to be government's responsibility. The resource will, will provide the maintenance, and it will save government a lot of money. So the government may be able to say, oh, we'll buy 100 cars this year. But if you are leasing, you may be able to lease 500 cars with the same money that you have. So we'll be able to equip government, we'll be able to equip our hospitals with all of that. Then the other area that we are looking at is the entrepreneurial area, which is in the establishment of an entrepreneurial hubs for small businesses. We have a lot of small business people who have ideas, who can do so many things but there is no capital to do it. You ask them to set up a factory, there is no money to set up the factory. So what you can do as government in the context of is to build these entrepreneurial hubs. Maybe it's a tailoring hub. You can build a, a fully equipped tailoring factory that is available. So if somebody has a contract to make uniforms, they will come and rent space and produce those uniforms, pay and go, and somebody else can come. So you can put these different things in the various hubs in the country so that small businesses can rent, whether it's in uniforms making, whether it's in shoes, whether it's in share butter processing. So you have these common user facilities without necessarily having to pay for each entrepreneur to set up these things. It will really help the small business uh, area. Then we have the two, uh, World Bank assisted job and skills project to provide apprenticeship to the youth, uh, skills development, and also grants uh, to help them set up their business. The fourth area is looking at what we call the transport sector recapitalization project. If you look at our transport sector, you will notice that a lot of the vehicles, whether they are the taxis, whether they are the trotros or buses, are very old. They are very old on the system. But we are building an automobile industry. What we want to make sure is not, it's just, not just that we are building the industry, but the people here, the business people, the commercial drivers and so on, should be able to own these vehicles. So we are setting up a transport sector recapitalization project so that we introduce a government-backed lease-to-own scheme where the existing commercial um, operators can essentially exchange their vehicles for new vehicles and pay over time because these vehicles are going to be assembled or manufactured in Ghana. So you exchange your existing trotro for a new one, and then you will get payment over time. And with this, you don't have to pay import duty. Uh, just like with the VWs or Toyota manufacturers or Kantanka and so on. You are not, because it's being made in Ghana, you, you, as a commercial driver or bus driver or whatever, you are not going to pay import duty because it is being made in Ghana. So with that, uh, interlinkage between uh, government coming in, between the commercial operators on one hand and the manufacturers on the other hand. The commercial operators don't have the capital. Again, there is market failure. And when there is market failure, government will come in to bridge the gap between the manufacturers of the vehicles and the users of the vehicles by providing a government bank scheme so that every trotro driver who wants to exchange their car for a new one will be able to pay over time they don't have to pay up front for the new bus or the new trotro. 
And when we do this, we will breathe life into the local industry because you have to need parts, manufacturing of parts, and, 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 and boom, let essentially there be a boom in the uh, automobile industry. And Ghana will become a center for West Africa. In, uh, many people will be coming here to buy these cars. And of course, we will also reduce accidents on our roads because you have new cars and road safety will, will be done. Finally, improving the business environment. We're going to, for businesses, introduce a single business identifier. Just as you have for individuals with a national ID card, you have that for businesses so that across interaction with government, there's one number, and that can easily be done because whenever you register a business, you have an, a, a number anyway. A business registration number is given, so that doesn't require new registration. We'll just make sure that is your unique identifier. And we want to introduce regulatory flexibility for micro, small, and medium enterprises in their compliance because there's so much hassle under the current uh, dispensation that we see um, for many micro, small, and uh, medium scale enterprises in complying with taxation and so on. So we want to introduce a simplified tax regime for micro, small, and medium scale enterprises with a very flexible one and make sure that they can file their taxes online on their mobile phone and make it so simple so that you know, collectors, tax collectors from GRA cannot come in and uh, harass them uh, for non-payment of taxes. In fact, we will totally discourage payment of taxes or levies in cash. You will do it on your mobile phone through mobile money. You will not have to pay any collector any cash. We will be... We will also want to reduce the cost of power. This is a major uh, problem for businesses. Uh, we have so much, so much in losses from ECG. Uh, about 40% of the power that is produced is lost uh, from ECG and also from transmission. And we are going to introduce new technology from the ECG perspective. They've piloted a new remote sensing technology, which is working very beautifully. And this is going to, we are going to begin implementation. Um, ECG um, have done so well in piloting this remote sensing technology. And I have some bad news for those who are stealing power. Uh, with this remote sensing technology, it will no longer be possible to steal power from ECG. And we will make the money to make sure we reduce the cost of power and everybody will enjoy it. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is broadly what is in the manifesto. These are the initiatives that are going to help us to drive growth. Of course, this is a summarized version, and I ask you to read the manifesto, get the details. But at the end of the day, I will close by asking, why should you vote for more for Nana? And you should vote for more for Nana so that he will provide the leadership of service to deliver on our promises, the leadership for service to protect our progress, and the leadership of service to transform Ghana for all. Thank you very much for your attention. Salaamu Alaikum.